Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to have you. So we're gathered once again this day to worship our Lord and to take communion together, remembering what Christ has done to rescue us from our sins. As we begin our time, let's stand as we worship our Lord and celebrate the amazing grace that he has given us.
Good morning and welcome as we gather to worship today. My name is Jonah and I'd like to welcome you, especially if you're a guest here with us this morning. If it's one of your first times with us, I direct your attention to the bulletin where you'll see a side connection card. We'd love if you would fill that out. That helps us connect with you and you connect with us. You can Fill that out and drop it in the offering boxes at the back of the room when you leave today. A few things that we'd like to make you aware of as we begin this morning. One of those is something we talked about last week, and that's our Foundations class. We're looking forward to our Foundations class happening on October 9th. Foundations class is for you if you are interested in learning more about the church, if you're hoping to get connected in different ways, perhaps you've been attending recently and want to connect more at the church. Uh, If you're interested, we'd love to have you. It's going to be immediately after the worship service on October 9th. We'll provide you lunch. We will talk about some of those things like the background of our church, what we believe, what we do and ways that you can get involved here. So we're looking forward to that. If you have questions or if you are interested in coming, please talk to me after the service, and we'll be sure to get you signed up. Other events and details can be seen in your bulletin as well. Take a look at that for updates on everything going on here at the church. Now I'd like to invite Todd Summer, our current elder chairman, up for an announcement that he has for us. morning. Uh, The elders met on Monday, September the 12th, and at that meeting that evening, we accepted the resignation of Scott Davis as our youth leader, effective October the 6th. I just wanted to publicly thank Scott for all that he's done. It's been four years, and uh, it's been kind of a difficult four years with the pandemic, but on behalf of the elders and the church, we just appreciate all that you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Uh, it has truly been an honor and a privilege to serve the last four years as a high school youth leader. I know I've learned and grown so much in my faith, and I pray and hope that the high schoolers have too. Uh, I want to thank the elders for the opportunity for this uh, huge responsibility the last four years. and. Um, Thank all of you for your love and support and and your prayers that I know you've given over the last four years. And also um, to Paul for your mentorship and and leadership through through that time and uh, the church staff for all their encouragement and support. Stephen Lane and and Nikki and Jamie for their help on Wednesday nights and all the other leaders that have have helped over the years. Uh, To my wife who's um, been there every step of the way and helped me through a whole lot of stuff. So... Uh, I love seeing God work in the, in the youth in this area, and uh, I am not, I'm stepping down from this, but I'm not stepping away from the youth. I'm definitely still going to be involved, and uh, please continue to pray for the high school and the middle school and all the youth of the area, because this time is difficult, and they definitely need your prayers and support through all of this, so I appreciate all of that. Thank you very much. Also that evening, the elders discussed uh, the youth leader moving forward, and I'm happy to announce that Jonah's going to be stepping up to lead the youth throughout this next school year. We're grateful to have him, and we're looking forward to his leading. If uh, you have any questions on the transition, talk to any of the elders, and uh, please pray for this transition as we go forward here. Thank you. In just a moment, we will take our offering. Would the ushers please come forward as we prepare to do so? And before we do that, please join me as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today thanking you for the work that you have done and continue to do in our congregation. We recognize this season of ministry that we're in, and we look to you for help and provision. Thank you for the faithful service of Scott in years past, all the relationships built, lessons taught, activities led, so much more that only you know. 
May you bless him and Leslie as they transition in this new season. We also ask your blessing upon the youth in our church and in our community. May you guide them through this transition. May you help our church as a whole, to be a place where young people of all kinds can be loved and experience community with others as they seek to grow in their relationship with you. We trust that you'll provide in these things. Lord, as we continue to worship today, we ask that you would grant us forgiveness and peace, that we would be cleansed from our sins and serve you with a humble mind, that we would find our joy and satisfaction in you as we are conformed to your son's image. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have the opportunity to take communion together as a church here in a moment, and we will prepare for that moment in song here. And before we do, I'd like to read a passage out of Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, this was written long before Jesus was crucified, and yet the prophet Isaiah predicted what he would have to suffer to forgive us from our sins. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Would you please stand with us as we... Thank our Lord for his sacrifice to forgive us from our sins. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary You, the perfect Holy One Crushed your Son Who drank the bitter cup Reserved for me Your blood has washed away my sin Jesus, thank you The Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus, thank you Once your enemy Now seated at your table Jesus, thank you By your perfect sacrifice your perfect sacrifice I've been brought near your enemy you've made your friend pouring out the riches of your glorious grace your mercy 
mercy and your kindness know no end. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table. Jesus, thank you. Lover of my soul, I want to live. Praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father. Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God from whom all blessings flow indeed. And in just a moment, we have the opportunity to celebrate and remember the greatest blessing that we can fathom as Christians, the blessing of Christ's work for us through his life, death, and resurrection, and the hope and forgiveness and life that that brings us. Here at the Bible Church, we practice what we call open communion, which means if you are a believer in Jesus, if you have come to trust in the saving work of Jesus through his life and death and resurrection and the forgiveness and hope that that brings us, we invite you to participate with us. In just a moment, we'll pass the elements and we invite you to hold those until we partake of those together. For those serving, please come forward. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Father, for your blessings. Thank you, Father, for your gifts. Pray, Father, we thank you for your, your unending mercy. 
We pray, Father, we give thanks to you, Father, but thanks seem so insufficient, Father, for what you've done for us. We thank you, Father, for the love that you've shown us by sending your one and only Son to die on the cross and be broken and his blood shed for us. We thank you for that, Father. May, Father, may we glorify and honor you by our worship this morning, right now, Father, with this communion and this remembrance of you. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul writes and says, For what I receive from the Lord, I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often 
As you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. I um, want to add my public appreciation to Scott and the work that he has done and will continue to do. Um, If I could encourage you, um, speaking for myself, uh, it is such an encouragement when I hear from you. And if you, uh, I keep them. When you write me notes, Um, Those mean a lot. You can text him, certainly. Uh, It's a different generation, I understand that. But uh, there's something um, about a written note as well, um, dropped in the mail. And so let me encourage you as our church body, if you've appreciated Scott, especially if he's ministered uh, at some great price to himself because of his work, uh, the man... I don't know when he sleeps and eats um, because of his work. He and Leslie, um, uh, if he has specifically ministered uh, to some of your children, then it would be most appropriate for you to to drop Scott a note and thank him uh, for the work that he has done in our midst. We look forward to what the Lord will do uh, through him in the days that are yet to come. Heavenly <laughs> Father, we, uh, <clears throat> we're grateful for your word. It is a lamp. It is a light. Uh, it is honey. It is bread. It is a sword. It is alive by the Spirit of God. Uh, in it, we find promises that sustain us and truth that convicts us, the presence of of the Lord that transforms us. Um, May you do that today as we come together uh, as your people and look in your word to your glory, we pray in Christ's name, amen. If uh, If you're not looking for it, it is absolutely possible to miss it. Um, Right now it is at its peak, um, The fall migration is underway, uh, and we have, in Illinois, uh, we are hitting the highest numbers. A lot of it happens, uh, a lot of it happens at night, but every now and then, um, we had a storm blow through Sunday evening, and I came out Monday morning to the woods and uh, uh, behind the church here, and the woods here were absolutely full of a phenomenal variety of warblers and all sorts of birds who had made an overnight stop uh, to refuel and rest up a bit. Uh, The storm had made them settle into the woods. And and after they had done that, I went out there yesterday again, uh, and they were gone. The woods were almost empty because they were moving on. The other thing that I observed Uh, which is just amazing, is uh, the fact that monarch butterflies also make a journey. They go from our neck of the woods all the way down to central Mexico. Central Mexico. And butterflies are fairly delicate. Uh, Some of them don't make it. A lot of them do make it. And um, uh, on Monday, when you would walk through Uh, the woods, when there were woods on either side of you, I've got a video of it, there were just dozens of these monarchs uh, in in the trees, again, resting up uh, so they could continue on their way down to Mexico. Interestingly enough, those 
do that on the east side of the Mississippi. Monarchs on the west side of the Mississippi uh, typically don't go to Mexico. They go to California. Isn't that amazing how the Lord has made that. Another bit of trivia, if you get this question on trivia night, monarch butterflies that make the journey, the ones that do the journey down to Mexico, their lifespan is longer than the normal monarch butterfly lifespan. The Lord has made them that way. It's amazing. Well, they do that compelled. I, I don't know if there's a, uh, I don't know if there's a meeting that the monarchs get to and they discuss, uh, hey, it's time to go. Let's go. Uh, pack your bags. We're leaving next Tuesday, 10 o'clock. Don't miss it. I don't know how that works, but I know there's, there's something that compels them. There's a desire, if we want to use that word, that drives them. There's a decision that is made to head for Mexico. We are also on a journey. We're on a journey. Uh, the Bible describes it that way. The Bible uses a word to describe us. It. it calls us sojourners. We don't use that word too much. It used to be a magazine by that name. We're pilgrims, another word that's used to describe us. We are on a journey as well. We began the journey. If we're Christians, um, I'm not assuming that you are, all of you, but if you are a Christian, you started that journey with the encounter with Jesus, whether you were five years old at the bedside of your parents here at a VBS, uh, here at our church, whether you were an adult in a hotel room and picked up a Gideon Bible, whether you were at home, you're my age, and you're watching Billy Graham, wherever you may have been, you encountered the gospel, you believed the gospel, you turned to Jesus in a historical moment in time, and you became a believer. And uh, that act commenced a journey that will culminate ultimately, at least this part of that journey will culminate in either Jesus showing up and taking you home to be with himself, or you dying in your bed of old age, or uh, being uh, run over by a tired farmer driving a semi. Something, somewhere, somehow, you shall die, or Jesus will take you home, and that journey will be over. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he truly is. The journey comes to its conclusion. And in that journey, there is this sense of longing that I want us to think about out of, we're almost done with this particular journey through the book of 1 Thessalonians. Turn there, 1 Thessalonians 5. I have two more sermons out of the book. Um, one out of the last few words Paul gives, greet brothers with a holy kiss, put you under their oath. We'll talk about the holy kiss uh, and the grace of our Lord Jesus. Some of you grew up in a church culture where that was practiced. We'll talk about that, uh, but we'll focus mostly on the grace uh, of the Lord Jesus be with you. Before this morning, we are at verse 23 and verse 24 of First Thessalonians chapter number 5. Now may the God of peace, Paul calls him that, the God of peace, peace not only the sense of um, security and hope that we experience, but also remember the God that brings us into peace with himself through the act of reconciliation, which comes through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's not just peace that you feel, it is peace that is your peace in reality, that you are no longer at war with God. Um, maybe better put, God is no longer at war with you. Uh, he has been propitiated, good biblical word. Now may the God of peace sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body, um, and we're not going to make a whole lot of that. There was, uh, when I was a teenager, there was a whole lot of, um, in some ways, time wasted uh, with arguments over whether man was made of three parts or man is made of two parts. Because Paul uses three and he uses two. You, Jesus uses two. Jesus uses three. I, I personally don't think that there's a lot of help to be gained 
Uh, there was an author, again, uh, people my age who were um, young and evangelical were influenced by a guy named Watchman Nee, uh, a Chinese man that wrote a lot of uh, books. Sit, Walk, and Stand was a book that he wrote on the book of Ephesians. Uh, he was deep into spirituality and talked about we are spiritual people, we are soulish people, we are physical people. Eh, maybe, but we have, we know that we have these these parts of us, if I could use that word, we are a physical body and we're also a spiritual person as well, but yet we are a whole person. I don't, part of the problem that comes is if we begin to see the spiritual, I mean the physical side of us as something that is discarded, even something that impedes us in our journey with Christ. And the Bible doesn't see it that way. But May he sanctify your whole spirit, soul, and body. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your body. Be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus because that is what state we must be in to enter into the presence of the Lord. We'll talk about that. And then this glorious verse, some of you have memorized it. It's a glorious verse to remember. He who calls you, and that word calls doesn't mean that. Your cell phone's going to ring, and you pick it up, and it says, there was a, do you remember a telephone call from God? There was a cassette tape. Do you remember cassette tapes were small plastic things that had this brown stuff, (laughs) and he used a pencil on them? Uh, um, Phone call from God. Uh, Well, you don't expect that. That That's not the way it's used. This calling by grace in which he pursues you and invites you into this relationship with him, calls you into this relationship with him. The same one who beckons you, calls you into this relationship, is faithful. He surely will do it. Hallelujah for it. Um, There's a book that's influenced me in this sermon. I I try not to be, um, I don't want to be a plagiarist. Uh, his name is James K. A. Smith. The book is, I'll put it out. It's on my desk. I forgot to put it out. I'll put it out if I remember after the sermon. You are what you love. James K. A. Smith. There were some things that he wrote, and I listened to it by a, a sermon by him this week that um, stirred some of these thoughts. Where his thoughts start uh, or end and mine begin, um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But let me give you some, if I may, some principles, and then we're going to come back to this text. Let me share these with you. Number one, Paul's text here is about our sanctification. That's what he's writing about. He writes about, may the Lord, the God of peace, sanctify you completely or or totally. Um, uh, God's will for us, uh, God's Intent for us is to conform us more and more to the likeness of Christ. Romans chapter number 8, uh, we know verse 28, all things work together for good to those who love God, called God, and conformed into his image, his likeness, verse 29. So God is at work transforming, making us more and more uh, like Jesus. Uh, sanctification is typically, as Christians thought of, as what this process is that makes us more and more like Christ. And the processes by which he does that, fellowship with the body, the Word of God, his own discipline, uh, transformation, all of these things that work. And it is that process, but it is also the state. And probably the Bible talks more about the state of holiness than the process of holiness. That's why when Paul writes the church, often he addresses them as saints. Saints. The saints. We don't feel like saints because we have a probably an unbiblical understanding of what saints are, but the scripture says there is, again, another word we don't use very often, imputed or given to us God's righteousness by which we're made holy, set apart for God's purposes. We are clothed, another word that's used, Paul helping to get this theological idea into our lives. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We are dressed, put on that righteousness. We stand before him clothed in the righteousness of Christ, seen in the beloved, adopted into the family. And so there is a sense in which this state is our current possession. 
You are chosen, holy, and beloved out of the book of Colossians. But when we think about holiness, there's a way in which I think holiness has been a little misconstrued in our world and has some negativity to it. Um, Let me give you a definition, and I don't know where I found this. It's not from me. Holiness refers to our living in this world. It's the way you shell corn. It's the way you raise your children. It's the way you interact with your friends. It's, it's how you look at Facebook. It's, it's the way we conduct our lives in the world, our words, our actions, and whether or not those words, actions, and being in this world accord with the value and worth of God, whether or not they're synced up with how valuable God is and how worthy God is, which is ultimately worship. There's a connection between holiness and worship. The essence of holiness in redeemed humans is the heart, our heart, that regards, loves, and delights in God according to his worth. We sense his worth, his value, more to be desired. I hunger and thirst after righteousness as the deer pants for the water. So my soul pants for you. We're a little squeamish, some of us, and I I understand that with the love language that's used sometimes out of Paul's epistles where Jesus is portrayed as the groom and the church as his bride and the love and adoration between the two. And so holiness is the expression, the lived out life that is shaped by, conformed to, driven by that desire, that longing, that value the prizing of God and his excellence. And it's lived out in the world in which we live. Now, I would submit to you, and this is one that I would like you to challenge me on if you're willing to do the homework. Don't just come and say, oh, yeah. But if you go and, ch- and, and study it out a bit, I would welcome the conversation, not the fight. In our current world, I think we have backed out of the idea of what it means to live the Christian life is holy, and we have put in, I think, what we would live the Christian life is authentic. That would be the word that we would use. We are looking for authentic people, which is a good thing, I think. Eric, and here's his name. I cannot pronounce it. T-H-O-E. N-N-E-S, T-H-O-E-N-N-E-S. Anybody here with that last name can tell me how to pronounce it? Tones? What? Tennis? Tennis? I do not believe it. (laughs) That can't be right. Anybody else? How about this? (laughs) He says, he's a professor of biblical and theological studies at Biola. He's talking about our experience with college students these days. Living authentically in his experience has come to replace living holy. To live holy is perceived to live as with a veneer. The higher calling is to acknowledge we all are flawed, we all have warts, we all have imperfections, we all have junk that's part of our humanity, which is a delightful thing and a good thing in a lot of ways. But he says our sins now have become the currency of solidarity. What brings us together, what we celebrate together is the fact that we're now nothing but a bunch of sinners that know Jesus. And there's a place for that. Indeed, there is. But it has diminished the idea that we need to grow in righteousness. It has killed our hope to a degree that we can be made different in Christ. We can be transformed in Christ. Now, again, don't misunderstand me. There is a call and a need 
Uh, you know, people talk about people come to church and they put on their church faces. People put on their nice clothes and they put on this fakey, fakey, uh, uh, syrupy. Uh, and what we ought to do is come to church like we really are and uh, yeah, on and on. And if you go to a bar, it's much more authentic than church. And we hear all of those things and, and it sounds cool and it's catchy. And there's, there's a kernel of truth which makes it good to us, but there's also a kernel of truth in which we begin to focus, and then it begins to become celebrated that the grace of God is really not able to change us. And so I live in my sin, I embrace my sin, because after all, you know, we're all warty people, and I can't have victories, so you know, be who you are. Principle number two, we are on a journey driven by that which we love, that which we imagine to be human flourishing. The good person now, the good treasure of his heart, Jesus says, produces good. The evil person now, the evil treasure of his heart or hers produces evil. Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. Here's something from James Smith. To be human is to be on a quest. He is a, a Christian, a professor of philosophy at Calvin College, I think. You cannot be headed nowhere. We all lean forward. We're all bent on arriving at the place that we long for. We What we long for is what we want, what we crave. To be human even as a believer, is to be animated and oriented by some vision of what the good life is, some picture of what we, thinks, we think counts as flourishing. We want that. We crave that. We desire that. We are oriented by our longings. We are directed by our desires. We adopt ways of life that are indexed to such visions of the good life. Not because we think through our options, but rather because some picture captures our imaginations. In other words, he says, it's not comes necessarily completely out of analytics. It comes because of the compulsion and desires of our hearts. We believe this is the good life. Is a question not of whether you long for some version of the kingdom, but which version do you long for? For. Now, dropping out of that, I want to give a few sub points, and there's several of these. This is kind of a hot mess, so if you want the notes, I can send them to you. Number one, we must understand that this desire that we experience is malleable and is ultimately shaped by our worship. This desire that we have that drives our quest is malleable. It's shapeable. The great spiritual war, right, Paul Tripp, the great spiritual war is being fought of the, let me the great spiritual war being fought for control of our hearts is a war of desire. Read James 4. Read 1 Peter 2. Paul Tripp. Remember this biblical principle. Whatever rules your heart controls your words and behavior. We do not live like the warblers and the butterflies, by instinct. You were created, designed by God, made in his image, with a capacity for desire. This means that everything you do or say is done or spoken out of want for something. You and I are always seeking something. You and I are always living for something. Beneath everything we do is the desire for something. Here is where the war is fought. Here is where the direction of our lives is shaped. What do we want? What do we long for? What do we desire? What do we hunger for? What do we thirst for? 
We can believe incorrectly, I think, that this desire is overpowering and unable to be directed. And we, if we're really going to be happy, have to live simply in the direction of that desire. And to do otherwise is to be inauthentic. This concerns me that we sometimes think that. Connie and I watched this um, British show. Uh, it was called The Foresight F-O-R-S-Y-T-E, Foresight Saga, 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 uh, from 2002. It, it focused on a family named Foresight, and in particular, a man from the family named Soames, S-O-A-M-E-S. That was his first name. One message came through loud and clear. We talked about it uh, almost every show. We talked about how it advocated this one message. It's the message Woody Allen said. You remember Willie, Woody Allen? You know who Woody Allen is, director, blah, 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 actor. Uh, he was um, hooked up with Mia Farrow. He broke up with Mira, Mia Farrow because uh, he fell in love with Mia Farrow's daughter. Um, and he said, when questioned about this relationship with this younger woman, this woman's daughter, he said, do you remember what he said? The heart wants what the heart wants. So the Foresight Saga is the story of these people, these human beings, and all the mayhem in their lives. I, we ask ourselves questions like, uh, when do these people walk their dogs? When do these people wash their dishes? They, they never seem to do the kind of stuff that, that we do. But they're making uh, their, their message, the whole show, I think there were two seasons, maybe three, the whole series ultimately was follow your heart, follow your heart. And as they followed their heart, believing that that's the only way that we can ultimately and finally live, that led to all kinds of awful stuff, disastrous stuff. So the biblical expression is guard our hearts. Our hearts can be shaped. Our longings can be shaped. Paul called on people to imitate me, be like me. The Bible describes hearts shaped by grace and forgiveness and mercy. Hear, my son, be wise. Direct your heart in the way. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desires of your heart. And so I'm submitting to you that desires take us and drive our lives, and those desires are shapeable. Not only am I saying they are shapeable, but I'm saying that we do shape them by the habits that we develop as human beings. They all, all of those things bring influence on our hearts. Your phone use. Uh, you know, like me, most of you have a love-hate relationship with your phone. You love them on one hand. I'm grateful when Connie's driving to Ohio, she can call me and be a, get a hold of me, uh, I'm grateful my children FaceTime me and I get to see my grandchildren. Uh, I can text the staff and they me. I, I'm so grateful for Google Maps. It has saved me so many times. I can get to Melvin and back now. All of that, all of that. I'm grateful, I'm grateful. But the habits, it, it shapes me. It, it molds me because ultimately my culture says we are consumers. That's what we are. We're consumers. They want us to be consumers. They're driving us to be consumers. They're shaping us to be consumers. And to a degree, my phone buys into that philosophy and shapes me as well. It creates envy and it creates covetousness and it creates lust. And those things drive my heart. And sometimes we have to peel back the veneer and look. But we are going to worship. We were created that way. David Foster Wallace, in a commencement address, said this. In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, he's not an evangelical believer. He's dead now. I'm not sure he was a believer. There's actually no such thing as atheism. Nobody's an atheist. There's no such thing as not worshiping. All of us worship. The only choice we get is what we worship. Anything else you worship other than 
And this is where he, a God, I would say anything else you worship other than the God, will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap your real meaning and desires from, you're never going to have enough. Never. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you'll always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you're going to die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, you're going to feel weak and afraid, and you'll need more power over others to keep that insecurity at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as the smart girl or guy, you're going to end up feeling stupid or fraud, always on the verge of somebody finding you out. The insidious thing about these forms, hear this, the insidious thing about these forms of worship is they are unconscious. They are default settings. They're the kind of worship that gradually slip into our lives day after day, and I would submit by the practices that we do, and the world will not discourage you from operating on these default settings. So our worship needs to be directed Godward. And our desires need to be Godward, and ultimately those desires are drip, uh, driven by what we see as human flourishing by the good life, and I'm making a direct connection in two minutes uh, time between the good life and our understanding of human flourishing and our own happiness, and I'm here to say I want to challenge you just a wee bit that happiness is not only a good thing, that holiness leads to happiness. Happy, Psalm 144, 15, are the people whose God is the Lord. Thomas Brooks, a Puritan, says, God is the author of all true happiness. He is the donor of all true happiness. He that hath him for his God for his portion is the only happy man in the world. Evangelist John Wesley said, when we first know Christ, that is when happiness begins. Happiness that is real. Happiness that is solid. Happiness that has substance. We have been taught to believe there are two doors in life. One says happy, one says holy. Choose one or the other. You can't have both. Which causes us some great consternation because our desires, our longings are toward human flourishing and the good life. And we have to be sure we impregnate that understanding of the good life with biblical truth. And in that good life comes happiness, but yet we've been told constantly we must choose holiness over happiness. And we have to be sure that those desires are driven by biblical truth. I've had people sit in my office and say, I deserve, I long to be happy, and this sinful choice is the choice by which I shall gain that happiness. And to my frustration, as it has turned out, and it's probably an indictment on me, no matter what argument I make, no matter what truth I speak, no matter what verse I share, if a person has reached that point when they come to see me, I've never been able to dissuade them. I'm betting zero. If they say, God has said, I believe I can only be happy if I make this choice and I say, that choice is going to bring hell literally to your front doorstep. Literally. So we've got to be sure that we're driven by biblical truth. Now, we believe that moral standards in our day, I'll be quick, are narrow-minded, limiting demeaning, impinging on happiness. C.S. Lewis said even in his day, holiness was thought as dull. George Morrison said when he was a kid growing up, church historian, I was presented a view of holiness that was melancholy, morose, sour, unpleasant. God is interested in your holiness much more than he is your happiness. If we choose to be holy, we cannot choose to be happy. We can only be miserable. We choose to be happy, God is grieved. 
But there are a lot of people from the past. Wesley, true religion, a heart right toward God and man implies happiness as well as holiness. George Whitfield, let me therefore say to you, my brothers and sisters, to have always before you the unspeakable happiness of an enjoying of enjoying. God. Adam Clark, every wicked man ultimately is a miserable man. God has wedded sin and misery as strongly together as he has holiness and happiness. H.A. Ironside, some of the senior saints will know him. Holiness and happiness are intimately linked. Charles Spurgeon, they, uh, the greatest happiness of a Christian is to be holy. Holiness is not slavery. Holiness is pleasure. Holiness, writes Spurgeon, produces happiness. Happy to be envied, say the Beatitudes, which are an invitation to live a life that's flourishing in the world. Jesus began that ministry by describing happy to be envied, We like the word, it sounds much more churchy, but it's closer to the translation, happy to be envied or the poor in spirit. This is the human life of flourishing as he describes it. Three points, and I will just give you these and quit. Sanctification is God's will and work. That's what Paul says. God has willed this sanctification to happen in your life. Number two, the sanctification is going to touch every area of your life. Uh, God, I was visiting someone recently and they had dogs, uh, Paul and Natalie Schmidt, and um, I couldn't figure out how they had tamed their dogs. I, I couldn't figure out how they had such untamed children and such tamed dogs. <laughs> but they, these dogs, there was a fence that I could not see. It was under the ground, Correct. And the dog had a collar, and if the dog ran to the fence, the collar beep, 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 and then it would give him a little bit of a jolt. Natalie told me she put the collar on her arm just to want to know what she was doing to the dog. <laughs> I admired her selflessness, even though I did think, Natalie, that was a little much. God will not be fenced in. You cannot say to God, you can have my church life, you can have my work life, you cannot have my married life, you can't have my parental life, you can't have my money life. God says, oh no, there is no area I'm not going to put my fingers on. Number three, sanctification as a work continues Till we're with Jesus, and we are assured of God's determination to complete it. Faithful is he who is called, who will also do it. But I'm here to say that this holiness, where do you find your greatest joy? Do you find your greatest joy looking at pornography? Or would you find greater happiness sitting with a bunch of friends around a campfire eating grilled burgers, watching a football game. Do you find your greatest happiness in living a narrow, self-centered, bolted-down life? Or do you find happiness in giving yourself away and you go to leave and you go, wow, I'm exhausted, but what great joy that brought me. Sin always promises, but it never delivers. It cannot. (laughs) God always promises, and God always delivers. To know Christ, to pursue him in holiness is the way of ultimate happiness in our life. Count it all a joy, my brothers and sisters. How can Paul do that? How can Paul and Silas sing in prison? Holiness brings happiness. Let's pray. Would you stand with me, please? Lord, you've called us to to delight in you, to find delight in you. 
If we're honest, some of us at least, if we're honest, we read those texts of Scripture, how the psalmist found delight in going to your house and singing and worshiping and how the Bible talks about knowing you to be something we desire more than gold and food. But if we're honest, some of us, that's not our reality. We would much rather eat a good hamburger than to eat the truth from your word. We'd, we'd much rather have the gold in our bank account than the gold of your promises in our heart. We'd much rather be with the buddies on the lake than to be with your people worshiping in your name. I pray that you would capture our desires, our longings, our passions. And I pray that the version of the Christian life that we translate to our children and to the community is one in which suffering is a living, powerful reality. But there is also joy and happiness in Christ. That it doesn't have to be superficial and weak and anemic. The joy of the Lord is my strength, we pray. Great is thy faith, peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow, blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may this promise sustain us. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go with that promise echoing in your heart and mind. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it.